Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Everyday Anarchism, the show about how anarchism, non-domination, cooperation, mutual aid is part of your everyday life. I am your host, Graham Colbertson, and this is another episode in my series on David Graeber's debt. This is Chapter 9, The Axial Age. First of all, welcome back to the debt series. I haven't worked on this series for months, so it feels to me like I took a very long hiatus. But it looks like episodes came out in June and then in August, so it was only gone for six weeks or so. Uh, I'm not making any promises, but I hope for the series to run roughly monthly, uh, a couple of episodes per month from here on in, and finish up in early 2025. No matter what, we've definitely passed the halfway point. Secondly, you've already heard the episode I did with John Weisfeiler on Chapter 9. I usually write my episode first, but I did it backwards and did the interview first with John. I was going to go ahead and publish this one first, but when I sat down to write it, I couldn't really make sense of the chapter without referring to what John shared with me. So I didn't want to just repeat what John had said to you. So now you can hear my thoughts after having already heard all the clarifying stuff John had to say. Finally, I have just fallen months and months behind on answering emails. If you've emailed me since like February, then I probably haven't gotten back to you. <laughs> Maybe I got back to you in the past month since I recorded this, but I think I'll try and record a, a Q&A episode with responses to any of the emails that it makes sense to answer in the podcast. Um, and in the meantime, I my apologies, and I will, I will answer those emails at some point. I, I truly believe that. All right, let's get to Chapter 9, and we'll also go back a bit to Chapter 7 as well. So first, to remind you of what John Weisfeiler said about the Axial Age. The Axial Age, according to Carl Jaspers, the founder of the term, was the great age of religion, or we could say idealism. Buddhism, Confucianism, Platonism, they all appear between 800 and 300 BC or so. Then comes a return to materialism in the form of the big empires, like, you know, the Roman Empire, for example, or the Qin and Han dynasties in China. And Graeber wants to label this entire period from 800 BC into 600 AD when the Roman Empire falls, asterisk, the Western Roman Empire, etc. Anyways, leaving that aside, he wants to label this whole period of almost a thousand years, he wants to label this whole period of almost 1500 years, one giant axial age with this just repeating cycle between idealism and materialism or thought and substance that's actually just two sides of the same coin. Materialism is a form of idealism and idealism is a form of materialism, he says. They are born out of one another and although the end result is, quote, an ideal division of spheres of human activity that endures to this day, on the one hand the market, on the other religion, they actually uh, totally fail to ever divide human activity into spheres in that way. And that quote is from the conclusion of the chapter, by the way. This division, and Graeber is attacking this kind of division from the very beginning of this book. He attacks it in the utopia of rules when he suggests that the bureaucracy of the state and the bureaucracy of corporations work together. And, you know, religion, which claims to be against the market, and markets, which claim to only care about things that are real, they work together. One cycles into ascendancy, but it does so through the workings of the other. That's the argument. And in chapter seven, Graeber does a kind of prehistory of this in the ancient Mesopotamian societies, your Babylons, your Sumers, etc., that I didn't cover and I'm going to try to cover now. He says the sort of conventional wisdom is that these societies were a tug of war between a city elite those of the big temples, and then your rural nomadic poor. And something like the Old Testament and the Quran, and even to a certain extent the New Testament, are the voices of the rural nomadic poor against something like the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is the voices of the temple. Here's Graeber. The reader will recall here that Mesopotamian city-states were dominated by vast temples, gigantic complex industrial institutions often staffed by thousands including everyone from shepherds and barge pullers to spinners and weavers to dancing girls and clerical administrators. The most dramatic and enduring crisis centered on prostitution. It's actually not entirely clear 
from the earliest sources whether one can speak here of prostitution at all. Sumerian temples do often appear to have hosted a variety of sexual activities. Some priestesses, for instance, were considered to be married to or otherwise dedicated to gods. What this meant in practice seems to have varied considerably. One thing the early texts do make clear is that all such women were considered extraordinarily important. In a very real sense, they were the ultimate embodiments of civilization. After all, the entire machinery of the Sumerian economy ostensibly existed to support the temples, which were considered the households of the gods. As such, they represented the ultimate possible refinement in everything from music and dance to art, cuisine, and the graciousness of living. Temple priestesses and spouses of the gods were the highest human incarnations of this perfect life. It's also important to emphasize that Sumerian men do not appear, at least in this earliest period, to have seen anything troubling about the idea of their sisters having sex for money. To the contrary, insofar as prostitution did occur, and remember, it could not have been nearly so impersonal, cold cash a relationship in a credit economy, Sumerian religious texts identify it as among the fundamental features of human civilization, a gift given by the gods at the dawn of time. Procreative sex was considered natural. After all, animals did it. Non-procreative sex, sex for pleasure, was divine. So in this early period, we have these temple priestesses, uh, none of whom probably should be considered prostitutes in the way we think of prostitutes, certainly not all of whom uh, had the job to have sex with men who came to the temple, but some of whom did, and this did not lower them. In fact, it elevated them, and their male relatives, Graeber says, doesn't seem to think that they were sullied by this. In fact, they were made sublime by their role as priestesses or dedicated to the gods. And from there, Graeber goes on to tell the story of Enkidu from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which I'll just give you the short version. Uh, Enkidu is a wild man, a shepherd of the fields, and he is an enemy of the city. Until he and the temple priestess Shamat have some of the most epic sex in mythological history. Either for a week straight, uh, I believe with one day of rest, or for two weeks with a day in between, depending on which tablet you believe. And the point for our purposes is that this is how Enkidu attains enlightenment, civilization. He's not lowered and debased by having sex with a prostitute. He is made human by experiencing the divinity that is sex with one of the women who is close to the gods. And if money is exchanged in this process, it's not because men are having sex with prostitutes. It's because people are, are tithing, are giving an offering up to the gods. But... In later periods, I know you knew this was coming, some Sumerian men did have problems with this, as well as some very famous other Mesopotamian men. The Desert Fathers, the Prophets, the authors of the Old Testament and the Quran, the Patriarchs. They object. And Graeber says the source of their objection comes from debt. Here's Graver. And remember, this is still in chapter 7, as a, I'm doing a prehistory for chapter 9. By circa 2400 BC, it already appears to have been common practice on the part of local officials or wealthy merchants to advance loans to peasants who were in financial trouble on collateral and begin to appropriate their possessions if they were unable to pay. It usually started with grain, sheep, goats, and furniture, then moved on to fields and houses, or ultimately family members. Servants, if any, went quickly, followed by children, wives, and in some extreme occasions, even the borrower himself. There were always tribal peoples living on the fringes. During good times, they began to take to the cities. In hard times, their numbers swelled with refugees, farmers who effectively became Inkadu once again. Uh, and this is me just breaking in. These are farmers who have lost their farms and indeed their wives and children to debt. So they go out to join the, the wild men. Back to Graeber. Then periodically, 
they would create their own alliances and sweep back into the cities once again as conquerors. It is difficult to say precisely how they imagine their situation, because it's only in the Old Testament, written on the other side of the Fertile Crescent from Sumer, that one has any record of the pastoral rebels' points of views. But nothing there mitigates against the suggestion that the extraordinary emphasis we find there on the absolute authority of fathers and the jealous protection of their fickle womenfolk were made possible by, but at the same time, a protest against this very commoditization of people in the cities that they fled. The world's holy books, the Old and New Testaments, the Quran, religious literature from the Middle Ages to this day, echo this voice of rebellion, combining contempt for the corrupt urban life, suspicion of the merchant, and often intense misogyny. One need only think of the image of Babylon itself, which has become permanently lodged in the collective imagination as not only the cradle of civilization, but also the place of whores. All right. That was a long quote from Graeber, but we needed it, I think. The place of whores, Babylon. Well, if we think of the Enkidu story, Shamhat isn't a whore. She is civilization itself. But by 2400 BC, Shamhat might not be a valued member of the civilization, but the enslaved daughter of a debt peon. And her father might have joined one of those wandering tribes who, you know, are called bandits or raiders, at least by the civilized people in the city. So the rules of the patriarchy, the rules that we are still inheriting today, that say there's something tainted about sex, and that it's a man's job to protect women from tainted sex, but also prevent her from partaking in that tainted sex, Graeber says that rule doesn't just come from the dour desert patriarchy. It's a compromise between the dour sex-controlling patriarchs and the cosmopolitan sex-controlling temples. The patriarchal control over women's sexuality came about only after the temple rulers were trying to use debt to exert control over women's sexuality. There's not some sort of goddess of love we can reclaim against the evil Old Testament patriarch god. The patriarchy we have today is a synthesis of the goddess of love tradition and the patriarchal thunder god tradition, and it's held together by debt. All right, so why did I spend so much time on this from chapter 7 when I'm supposed to be doing chapter 9? First, because I regret not getting to it earlier. This was one of those big aha moments for me, reading debt. But second, because I think this is a prefiguring of the main argument in the Axial Age chapter. The system we have today, in which the state is at war with the market. And yes, John, I got your email about that, and I totally agree with you. I'll be covering John's email in a future episode. Um, anyways, in which the state is at war with the market, or ideas are different from things, or this world is a mere shadow compared to the other world. This balance, this set of dichotomies, is an illusion. These two things always go together. The other world was born when people started trying to explain the substance of this world. Or, in different philosophical traditions, this world was explained when people began with the assumption that the other world was more substantial. This is another one of the big, earth-shattering, the ultimate hidden truth of the world moments in Graeber. Money and faith only sometimes think that they are separate. They're actually the same thing. In the same way that the scion daughter of the desert family has to have her sexuality protected, not in spite of the fact that temple prostitutes exist, but precisely because temple prostitutes exist, and it's because debt could potentially make her a temple prostitute, that she becomes a prisoner of her father's paranoia about her sexual degradation. How does this play out in chapter 9? Well, let's do it. I tend to focus on the ancient Mediterranean in this series. First of all, because as a literature person, at least one trained in the United States, I've read lots of ancient Greek poetry and literature. And as a philosophy person, I've read lots of ancient Greek philosophy. And as a fan of the podcast of Mike Duncan and Anthony Caldellis, I have a, I think, strong, although non-expert grasp on the Roman Empire. But since John Weisweiler and I covered the Mediterranean, I will try and go into the areas, China and India, where I am less comfortable and pretty much just skip the Greeks and Romans in this episode. All right, here's the big arc that Graeber gives us from the beginning of the chapter. 
For most of the great urban civilizations of the time, the early Iron Age was a kind of pause between empires, a time when political landscapes were broken into a checkerboard of often diminutive kingdoms and city-states, most often at constant war externally and locked in constant political debate within. Each case witnessed the development of something akin to a dropout culture, with ascetics and sages fleeing to the wilderness or wandering from town to town seeking wisdom. In each two, they were eventually reabsorbed into the political order as a new kind of intellectual or spiritual elite, whether as Greek sophists, Jewish prophets, Chinese sages, or Indian holy men. All right. So first, uh, I want to point out that Graeber is using the term dropout culture, which is a deliberate callback to the 60s. He's continuing to try to collapse the distinction between present and past because he just is not having any of these giant markers of how things changed forever and how we've moved totally past something and into some new era. And in fact, he thinks we have been stuck for, you know, in some ways for a few hundred years, in some ways for a few thousand years. <laughs> I also want to say when he talks about a dropout culture, that calls to mind the 1960s. It makes me also think of Emerson and Thoreau, who, of course, became, you know, Emerson was banned from Harvard's campus. And then now there's buildings named after him on Harvard's campus. So there's there's that arc again. All right. The bigger thing, though, is that we're just repeating with some variations the Desert Fathers versus the Big City story. Sages like Buddha or Jesus or Emerson or Timothy Leary are voices in the wilderness crying out against the empire. But then their intellectual descendants are part of the empire, although they claim to be reforming it from the inside. This story owes a lot to Nietzsche's genealogy of morals, and I find it quite convincing. Moreover, considering the fact that we are still arguing two or three thousand years later about Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Confucius, and Lao Tzu, I feel like that makes this age pretty axial. As Graeber puts it, paraphrasing Jaspers, we find in the actual age in these figures almost the entire range of positions about the nature of the cosmos, mind, action, and the ends of human existence that have remained the stuff of philosophy to this day. As one of Jasper's disciples later put it, overstating only slightly, quote, no really new ideas have been added since that time. And that's the end of both the Graeber quote and the quote from Jasper's student. All right, so this is a truly axial age. We're still arguing about it. Let's go look at that axial age and the dialectical arc as it plays out in India. The Bronze Age civilization of the Indus Valley collapsed sometime around 1600 BC. It would be about a thousand years before India saw the emergence of another urban civilization. When it did, that civilization was centered on the fertile plains that surround the Ganges further east. Here too, we observe at first, a checkerboard of different sorts of governments. From the famous Kshatriya republics with a populace in arms and urban democratic assemblies, to elective monarchies, to centralized empires like Kosala and Magadha. Both Gautama, the future Buddha, and Mahavira, the founder of Jainism, were born in one of the republics, though both ultimately found themselves teaching within the great empires, whose rulers often became patrons of wandering ascetics and philosophers. All right, breaking in here. Now this sounds to be not so much of uh, the 1960s, but of the Enlightenment, like Frederick the Great sponsoring Voltaire in the hopes of ruling in a more enlightened way. He's obviously also uh, comparing the Kshatriya republics to ancient Athens. Um, back to Frederick the Great, the great enlightened despot of this period is Ashoka. Here's Graeber's story of Ashoka. Ashoka famously began his reign in conquest in 265 BC, destroying the Kalingas, one of the last remaining Indian republics, in a war in which hundreds of thousands of human beings were, according to his own account, killed or carried off into slavery. Ashoka later claimed to have been so disturbed and haunted by the carnage that he renounced war altogether, embraced Buddhism, and declared that from that time on, his kingdom would be governed by principles of ahimsa, or nonviolence. Here in my kingdom, he declared in an edict inscribed on one of the great granite pillars in his capital of Patna, which so dazzled the Greek ambassador Megisthenes, no living being must be killed or sacrificed. That's the end of that, that quote, and Graeber goes on to say, such a statement obviously can't be taken literally, 
Ashoka might have replaced sacrificial ritual with vegetarian feasts, but he didn't abolish the army, abandon capital punishment, or even outlaw slavery. But his rule marked a revolutionary shift in ethos. Aggressive war was abandoned, and much of the army does seem to have been demobilized, along with a network of spies and state bureaucrats with the new proliferating mendicant orders, Buddhists, Jains, and also world-renouncing Hindus, given official state support to preach to the villages on questions of social morality. Ashoka and his successors diverted substantial resources to these religious orders, with the result that, over the next centuries, thousands of stupas and monasteries were built across the subcontinent. Ashoka's reforms are useful to contemplate here because they help reveal just how mistaken some of our basic assumptions are, particularly that money equals coins and that more coins in circulation means more commerce and a greater role for private merchants. In reality, the Magadha state promoted markets but had been suspicious of private merchants, seeing them largely as competitors. Merchants have been among the earliest and most ardent supporters of the new religions. Jains, owing to their rigorous enforcement of rules against harm to any living creature, were obliged to become, effectively, a mercantile caste. Mercantile interests fully supported Ashoka's reforms. Yet the result was not an increase in the use of cash in everyday affairs, but exactly the opposite. A couple things real quick before we move on. First, I forgot to say that I don't really know how to pronounce any of these uh, terms from the ancient Indus Valley, so sorry that I pronounced them incorrectly. Secondly, I'm recording this in my office at UNC, and there is some demolition going on. I don't think it's that loud, but it sounds like you'll hear the occasional thud as the building next to mine gets gutted. All right, so uh, the, the big point I want to draw from here is that we think that money equals coins, and Graeber's point since chapter one has been that it doesn't, it doesn't in our current world, and it didn't in the ancient world. Money can be coins, but what it really is is debt. Coins are just one way to formalize debt, and the different ways of formalizing debt have different results. Although, as you probably remember from the Vice Filer episode, Graeber was wrong about coins in lots of places, even though the way he described the coins working, Vice Filer thought he was right about. The other thing, though, that you probably know is that different ways of formalizing debt have different results. But Graeber says then, in the long run, if you formalize the debt differently, you end up in the same place. The ultimate result of all of these peaceful credit arrangements is just going to be the cycle again. Despite the fact that these credit arrangements are meant to be peaceful, people will get into debt, their property will need to be seized, and then will need to have to make money to pay the men to use violence to rip people out of these social relationships, which means we will make slavery and war all over again. Then we'll make new ways of formalizing debt that are more impersonal, like hacked silver, or coins, and the imperial wars will be unleashed again. Uh, that's that's the arc that Graeber is sharing. And as you know from my discussion with Luke Kemp, I and Luke are, are, are skeptical about much of this. On the other hand, uh, I guess what I'm really skeptical about is how similar he says the three different places are, uh, ancient Greece, ancient India and ancient China, but a lot of this stuff about the Ark seems to me right. Okay, I'm going to skip the very brief historical bit about China and then get to where he describes the philosophical import of all this, where his examples are mostly from China. Here's the philosophy. The first thing is that Graeber wants to disagree with Jaspers who, remember, thought that the Axial Age was the age of ideas, and then the age that came after it was the age of material things. Um, but what's really important for Graeber in terms of the ideas about these physical things, at least at first, is that pretty much everyone had to have these ideas. You could no longer live in the material world separate from the intellectual world. Here's Graeber. The Axial Age was the first time in human history when familiarity with the written word was no longer limited to priests, administrators, and merchants, but had become necessary to full participation in civic life. In Athens, it was taken for granted that only a country bumpkin would be entirely illiterate. Without mass literacy, neither the emergence of mass intellectual movements nor the spread of Axial Age ideas would have been possible. By the end of the period, 
These ideas had produced a world where even the leaders of barbarian armies descending on the Roman Empire felt obliged to take a position on the question of the mystery of the Trinity, and where Chinese monks could spend time debating the relative merits of the 18 schools of classical Indian Buddhism. Now, the next thing is, remember, all these ideas were in some ways about how to fix this system of debt, violence, and slavery. That's how you get the people involved in ideas. And remember that the ideas were generated by elites who were also in some ways dropouts. This is how you get the elites and the people all talking about these same things. Graeber has a brief interlude where he says there's a big question, or there seems to be a big question, if you're one of these thinkers who's trying to solve this problem. Are you going to use the same terms as the system, but try to get a different outcome? Or are you going to try and throw away the terms the system is using to get your different outcome? Here's Graeber. Mo Di, the founder of Moism, took the first approach. He turned the concept of Li, profit, into something more like social utility. And then he attempted to demonstrate that war itself is by definition an unprofitable activity. The Confucians took the opposite approach rejecting the initial premise. A good example is most of the opening of Mencius's much-remembered conversation with King Hui. Venerable sir, the king greeted Mencius, since you have not counted a thousand miles too far to come here, may I suppose that you also have something with which you may profit my kingdom? Mencius replied, why must your majesty necessarily use this word profit? What I have are only these two topics, benevolence and righteousness and nothing else. All right, that's the end of the little narrative. So the point Graeber's making is that the Confucians and the Moists want the same thing. Less war, less slavery, less poverty, more justice, more righteousness. Mo uses the term profit to argue for it. Mincius denounces the word profit. But according to Graeber, the end point was roughly the same. The Confucian ideal of Rin, of human benevolence, was basically just a more complete inversion of profit-seeking calculation than Modi's universal love. The main difference was that the Confucians added a certain inversion to calculation itself, preferring what might almost be called an art of decency. Taoists were later to take this even further with their embrace of intuition and spontaneity. All were so many attempts to provide a mirror image of market logic. Still, a mirror image is ultimately just that. The same thing, only backwards. Before long, we end up with an endless maze of paired opposites. Egoism versus altruism, profit versus charity, materialism versus idealism, calculation versus spontaneity, none of which could ever have been imagined except by someone starting out from pure, calculating, self-interested market transactions. And this, me breaking in again, is where we started. You can try to defeat the profit system by co-opting it, or you can try to defeat the profit system by turning it upside down. Either way, though, you're trying to build a reverse version of the bad system, and you're just doing schismogenesis, defining yourself as the opposite of the other thing, and thus becoming the same thing, only backwards. The state and the market, or the spiritual world and the material world, or any other paired opposites are just forever the same thing, cycling back and forth, but not really changing. Yin and yang is a pretty good metaphor for this. Now, the conclusion. Here's Graeber. What we see then is a strange kind of back and forth, attack and riposte, whereby the market, the state, war, and religion all continually separate and merge with one another. Let me summarize it as briefly as I can. And <laughs> when I got to this giant graver quote, I tried to cut it down, but I cut it down very little because when he says he's doing it briefly, it's, it's brief, but it's also a long quote. Here we go. One, markets appear to have first emerged in the Near East at least as a side effect of government administrative systems. Over time, however, the logic of the market became entangled in military affairs, where it became almost indistinguishable from the mercenary logic of axial age warfare, and then finally, that logic came to conquer government itself to define its very purpose. 2. As a result, everywhere we see the military coinage slavery complex emerge, we also see the birth of materialist philosophies. They are materialist, in fact, in both senses of the term. 
in that they envision a world made up of material forces rather than divine powers, and that they imagine the ultimate end of human existence to be the accumulation of material wealth, with ideals like morality and justice being reframed as tools designed to satisfy the masses. Three, everywhere too, we find philosophers who react to this by exploring ideas of humanity and the soul attempting to find a new foundation for ethics and morality. Four, everywhere, some of these philosophers made common cause with social movements that inevitably formed in the face of these new and extraordinarily violent and cynical elites. The result was something new to human history, popular movements that were also intellectual movements due to the assumption that those opposing existing power arrangements did so in the name of some kind of theory about the nature of reality. Five, everywhere, these movements were first and foremost peace movements and that they rejected the new conception of violence and especially aggressive war as the foundation of politics. Six, everywhere too, there seems to have been an initial impulse to use the new intellectual tools provided by impersonal markets to come up with a new basis for morality and everywhere it foundered. Moism, with its notion of social profit, flourished briefly and then collapsed. It was replaced by Confucianism, which rejected such ideas outright. We have already seen that reimagining moral responsibility in terms of debt, an impulse that cropped up in both Greece and India, while almost inevitable given the new economic circumstances, seems to prove uniformly unsatisfying. The stronger impulse is to imagine another world where debt, and with it all otherworldly connections, can be entirely annihilated, where social attachments are seen as forms of bondage, just as the body is a prison. 7. Rulers' attitudes changed over time. At first, most appear to have affected an attitude of bemused tolerance toward the new philosophical and religious movements while privately embracing some version of cynical realpolitik. But as warring cities and principalities were replaced by great empires, and especially as those empires began to reach the limits of their expansion, sending the military coinage slavery complex into crisis, all this suddenly changed. In India, Ashoka tried to refound his kingdom on Buddhism. In Rome, Constantine turned to the Christians. In China, the Han Emperor Wu Ti, 157 to 87 BC, faced with a similar military and financial crisis, adopted Confucianism as the philosophy of state. 8. The ultimate effect was a kind of ideal division of spheres of human activity that endures to this day. On the one hand, the market. On the other, religion. To put the matter crudely, if one relegates a certain social space simply to the selfish acquisition of material things, it is almost inevitable that soon someone else will come to set aside another domain in which to preach that, from the perspective of ultimate values, material things are unimportant, that selfishness or even the self are illusory, and that to give is better than to receive. If nothing else, it is surely significant that all the Axial Age religions emphasize the importance of charity a concept that had barely existed before. Pure greed and pure generosity are complementary concepts, and neither could really be imagined without the other. Both could only arise in institutional contexts that insisted on pure and single-minded behavior, and both seem to have appeared together wherever impersonal, physical, cash money also appeared on the scene. All right, that was the crux of of this chapter and maybe the entire book i have very little to say there's not much to add he said it except as kind of a footnote to agree with him again on how bad charity is charity is the byproduct of exploitation i mean as you'll hear in my conversation with eleanor yanaga it's better to have capitalists who believe in giving back than capitalists who don't believe that but you can only give back if you have in fact taken. So charity assumes that you are a profiteer, a bandit, a capitalist. I think that encapsulates pretty well the whole interminable cycle of trying to use the concept of debt to get out of the trap that debt has put you in. All right, that's it for chapter nine. Next up, we're going to the Middle Ages. Remember, you can email me at everydayanarchismpodcast at gmail.com. I hope to put out a Q&A episode pretty soon. 
maybe you can get in before that comes out. It helps if you leave a review on Apple or Spotify. You can also find me at everydayanarchism.com, which is where you can give to the show if you would like to help out. Thank you to everyone who has given. Thank you, of course, to my editors. And the music, which you are about to hear, is by David Hill.